Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Hello and good afternoon, good evening, good morning, or heck, even maybe good night. I don't know what time you're listening to this. You're tuned in to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. My name is Andrew Lawton, better known as your host for the next however long this takes. It's not a conventional radio show. I don't need to worry about someone telling me I need to wrap it up for news, and I'm so grateful for that. I lost what I was saying there, but in any case, thank you very much for tuning in. I am so very excited about the show today. I always try to be, but this week in particular, we have two very exciting interviews for you in the latter part of the show here. I'm going to be joined by free speech warriors, and that's really what they are. Lars Hedegaard and Paul Weston, both of whom were in Toronto last week, speaking uh, at an event sponsored by the Jewish Defense League. And I was separately able to wrangle both of them down for interviews. I'll play those for you in full form. Absolutely phenomenal gentlemen. That's coming up later on. But I have to begin by talking about an issue which really could not have timed more perfectly with what's coming up in the back half of the show with Lars and Paul. And that's the terrorist attack that took place on Canadian soil in Toronto this week. Now, I say terrorist attack. Some people on the left, in fact, it seems like the vast majority on the left, don't want to call it that. They'd prefer to call it the act of a madman. They'd prefer to call it a random incident. They'd prefer to call it workplace violence in the case of Nadal Hassan, the army psychiatrist that shot up soldiers at Fort Hood. But let's call a spade a spade. A terrorist stabbed two soldiers in Toronto. The name of the suspect, Ayanli Hassan Ali, 27-year-old Muslim man born in Montreal. His excuse, Allah told him to do it. Don't you hate those Lutherans? Isn't it terrible when those, you know, darn terrorist Lutherans get told by their... Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Sorry. Nope, never mind. I take it back. Must have read the wrong thing there. He stabbed two Canadian soldiers at a recruitment center in North York. These are the people that he thought were the enemies of Canada. He says, Allah told me to do this. Now, I wondered if Prime Minister Justin Trudeau thought maybe he felt excluded. Maybe we need to pinpoint the root causes and really get to the bottom of what could make him feel that way. And even, and much to my pleasure, actually, even the Prime Minister called this an act of hate and terror. He realizes now that he's prime minister of this country, you can't just deal in the romantic, airy-fairy, sunny ways abstracts. You have to realize that the real threats do exist. That some people actually want to commit acts of harm against Canadians and are driven by an ideology. And a belief that they can and will advance that ideology through violent ends. That's the belief. That's the belief system that these people hold. And I'm sadly disappointed by Police Chief Mark Saunders' response to this. He said he doesn't want, quote, Islamophobia nonsense, unquote, following the stabbing of two people by, oh yeah, an Islamic terrorist. It doesn't get more clear than his statement to police even that Allah told him to do this. But earlier on, Saunders wouldn't even confirm that. All he would say is that the man made words that were concerning to police, but police wouldn't tell us what they were. And then it was media reports, quoting police sources, that really drove that part into the spotlight as to what the man actually said, which puts a hugely significant context on the whole story, on the whole case here. But again, Police Chief Saunders says about the man who, again, said Allah made him stab two soldiers, quote, too early to say, unquote, regarding the question of whether or not he had been radicalized. Now, if the terrorists shot the soldiers, the left would blame guns. They'd say, oh, see, this is what happens when you let people have guns in Canada. But because it's a stabbing, well, mental illness is to blame. See, it's in the manual. 
Anything that avoids Occam's razor and what it would call the most direct line to reach your conclusion that a man who's part of a religion that has a number of adherents in the world of its 1.6 billion members that they who say in this particular case with this man that Allah made them do it, why can we not call that terrorism? That is not an indirect conclusion to reach as a result of this. But again, we're just told that the police want to avoid Islamophobia nonsense. Islamophobia nonsense. Now, I posted a link to this on Twitter. I spoke about this the day after it happened on my radio show on AM980 in London. And a Muslim man called in to defend Muslims. He said, no, Islam is a religion of peace. Muslims would not hurt people. Muslims would not kill people. Now, this interview took place the day after, about 16 to 18 hours after this happened. I'd been talking about it for 45 to 50 minutes, and I mentioned to him, I said, look, I I don't think this man, Ali, got the memo. And he said, who's that? He hadn't even heard of the case. He hadn't even heard of the terrorist attack in Toronto, and his default knee-jerk reaction is, no, 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 Muslims don't do this. And he actually had the audacity to tell me that Christians and Jews are just as prone to be terrorists. As Muslims. You you know what? I'm actually going to play this call for you because I think this speaks volumes about the mindset that some people have that makes it so difficult to have an honest discussion about this issue. Deke, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, Andrew. Hi. And uh, is some of the the callers who call in the station, it's misinformed, it's disingenuous about the Sharia law and about the Muslim brother in general. And I hope they got some of perspective to learn about the, the religion of Muslim. Muslim is a peaceful religion. It's a 1.6 billion people. So few guys who does something wrong, we should not be brushed in general. The terrorism, if we're looking about the terrorism in general dictionary, if you are terrorizing your neighbor, if you are terrorizing the people, if you are terrorizing and you're doing something out of ordinary, that's a terrorism. It has nothing to do with the religion. If you look at a dictionary, that may be the case. If you look at a newspaper, it's a different story. Well, the media, how they are betraying about the Islam and the Muslim and the way some of your callers... It's a very disturbing, and some of them, they're saying the south of the border, what he's doing to Trump, then they should belong to go to the south of the border. Canada is a peaceful country. We should not be starting using the, those language, using a Canadian, each other, who live peaceful here. Then why are there terrorists that are, char- that are targeting this peaceful country of Canada? Well, it's a few people who targeting could be even... The, Christians, could be the Muslim, could be the Jewish, could be any religion. So, uh, wait, hang on. When was the last time a Jewish person or a Christian stabbed two soldiers in Canada, Deke? Listen, Timothy McVeigh, he was a Christian. If we look at other terrorism who did it something wrong, they were Christians. If we have few people who When was it, the last time a Christian or a Jew strapped on a bomb vest and killed innocent people in Canada? Well, I never heard that. Then uh, why did you just say they could do it as well? Well, we don't we don't presume, and and we don't. I hope that it's not the case, and that is, doesn't happen here. And Canada is a peaceful country, and we don't should not start this kind of ideology and 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 putting and our Canadian each other against and and using Muslim religion as a, as a, as a demagogic and the language now. Well, it, it would appear that Mr. Ali missed that memo. Then, Deke, he didn't get the memo that this is not what he's supposed to do. Oh, Mr. Ali. The man we're talking about this segment, the man who just stabbed two soldiers in Toronto because they were Canadians. Well, I didn't hear that man you're talking about. I just came out in my car and I hear about the the few callers that were making about the comment about the Muslims. All right, well, look at the news, because a Muslim man said Allah told him to stab two Canadian soldiers. And call me back once you're caught up, Deke. Yeah, I never heard back from him, just so you know. We're back to the real podcast now. I never heard back from that man. But this is what we're dealing with. And you know what? I feel for this guy. This man, I don't believe from what I know that he's a violent human being. And he doesn't want his religion to be tainted with the brush that these terrorists have on them. But ignorance is not excused. 
And there's even greater ignorance on the left by people that don't want to acknowledge or refuse to acknowledge that terrorism is a threat. And I don't know how many times this has to happen for the left to stop saying, well, you know, not all Muslims are terrorists. No one's saying all of them are. No one is saying that all Muslims are terrorists. No one is saying that all Muslims are violent. No one is saying that everyone wants a violent overthrow of the government that will result in Sharia law. I do not care about the peaceful majority right now. I'm concerned about the violent minority. Just as I'm insignificant in discussions about terrorism, I'm not concerned about the majority of peaceful Muslims. I'm concerned about the ones who are out there who believe that this is acceptable. I'll have to share this very brief story with you. I remember back in November when I was in Israel, I spoke to a Palestinian journalist, Maher Shalabi, and he hosts a show called Transparent, and he does basically what I do, but on TV and for Palestinians. He's in Ramallah in the West Bank. And he said that he did a call-in topic, because when I was there in November, there had been a a rampant epidemic, which is uh, unfortunately still going on, of knife stabbings of Jews in the streets by Palestinian Muslim terrorists. And he said that he had a call-in show, is it acceptable, is it right or wrong, to stab Palestinians in the street? And he assured me most said no. That was the best he could do, say, well, most said no. I'm not concerned about the most said no. I'm concerned that there are people that called into a radio show and said, yes, I think that's acceptable. I'm concerned that there seem to be a sizable enough number in that 1.6 billion of Muslims in the world that think picking up a knife and stabbing someone because they are not a Muslim is acceptable. That think, yes, you can strap on a bomb vest because Allah commanded you to it. That, yes, you can en masse rape women in the streets of Cologne. I'm concerned about those ones. And people have said to me, well, do you criticize, you know, Christian terrorists? And I say, first off, name one. Okay, name two. Okay, name three. And people will go back, you know, 40 years to find terrorists that have identified as Christians. And I say, okay, name any Christian who endorses that. Christians disavow 100% Christians or so-called Christians that commit acts of terror in the name of their religion. Unfortunately, there is not unanimity in the Muslim community about acts of terrorism by Islamic extremists. Again, most say it's wrong. Most say it's wrong, but still, these people can all be traced back to mosques where other people are attending. And in some cases, multiple terrorists have been groomed from the same mosque. Multiple terrorists can be traced back to the same place, to the same school sometimes. And we still have the fundamental question of, okay, if so many people are against this, if these are all outliers, not the rule, which I agree, by the way. How many outliers does it take until we recognize that maybe there is, in fact, a pattern? And that pattern is not that Muslims are terrorists. That pattern is that Islam has a terrorism problem. And it is the responsibility, the moral imperative of anyone to call out extremists from within their own ranks. It's the responsibility of Christians to condemn the Westboro Baptist Church. It's the responsibility of conservatives to deal with the extremists in our own ranks who bring a bad name to the rest of us. But the problem is, in those groups, we're not talking about people that are going out and killing people. We're talking about people that are tweeting offensive words. Our extremists, I would take any day over one of their extremists. A fundamentalist Christian believes you're going to burn in hell if you're gay. A fundamentalist Muslim will kill you to get you there for the same reason. Which is more threatening to you? So when this man, Deke, calls in and says, oh, well, you know, Christians, Muslims, they've, they've all Jews, you know, it's all part of the same problem here. You put me in a room with three extremists, one from each of the Abrahamic faiths. I can tell you which one is going to be the most prone to violence, and it's not going to be the guy with the yarmulke, and it's not going to be the guy with the cross. It's that simple. 
we have to deal with questions of terrorism not by talking about the peaceful majority of Muslims. We have to deal with questions of terrorism by talking about the very real threat it poses and the fact that this ideology of radicalism does in fact lead people to believe that violence is the answer. But again, people have tried to move the goalposts, redefine what terrorism is. Say, oh, well, no, 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 lone wolf attacks aren't terrorism. Lone wolf attacks are just mental illness. Well, why is it that their people seem to have an ideology driving their mental illness? I don't have the answer to that question. Except maybe it's not as easy as just blaming mental illness for these issues. I'm a guy who's dealt with mental illness. There are different forms of it. I get that. I didn't kill anyone. I mean, I tried to kill myself, but I, I'm terrible at it. So I'm still here. But other mentally ill people, somehow it translates to Allah. Not just the voice in my head said to kill, but Allah said to kill. That seems very specific. Seems like that belief had already been ingrained in his mind. And people will also say, well, read the Bible. The Bible's just as violent as the Koran. First off, it's not, but are there violent passages in the Bible? Absolutely. Are there passages in the Bible that do not apply to a lot of people? Absolutely. I'd say most people probably don't live their lives by the letter of the law in the Bible. And that's a conversation Christians can debate until the cows come home. But again, how many Christians do we have that are using their Bible as justification to commit murder? And how many Muslims do it? This is not a question of Islamophobia. This is not a question of racism. This is, this is not a question of bigotry, of xenophobia. This is a question of statistics. But apparently numbers are racist. Numbers are xenophobic. Numbers are blankophobic, whatever the phobia is. You know, Candace Malcolm, who's been a guest on this show a number of times, absolutely phenomenal woman, a friend of mine, she wrote a piece about this, and she <laughs> actually raises a very amusing but also an incredibly apt question about this. She says, Islamophobia, what about knifeophobia? She talks about Chief Mark Saunders' comments about so-called Islamophobia nonsense and how he'd like to avoid that in response to this terrorism. She says that CSIS has joined the RCMP and local police in investigating this, which is quite effective, but also points out that Saunders says it's too early to know. She says, why aren't we worried about knifeophobia? The man that allegedly walked into the military recruitment center went on a stabbing spree against uniformed personnel, invoking the name of Allah, like, you know, suicide bombers do when they blow themselves up as well. She talks about the fact that this is a year and a half after two soldiers were killed in separate fatal attacks by radicalized Muslims, Nathan Cirillo and Patrice Vincent. But she said, we're getting lectures about Islamophobia. She says that the latest CSIS report, and I talked about this last week on the show, revealed 180 Canadians involved with radical Islamic terrorism abroad. Well, 60 have returned to Canada. Islamic terrorism is a threat, but the police chief is trying to show his tolerance and say, whoa, 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 we don't want to jump to conclusions. We know exactly who he was and what he was. We're not talking about indicting him without a trial here. We're talking about becoming aware, more aware anyway, of a very real threat that exists in North America. And that's terrorism. Terrorism of all forms is wrong. Like I said at the top of the show, killing is wrong. Murder is wrong. But when we can pinpoint one particular ideology that seems hellbent on furthering these things, you'd think that would attract a little bit more recognition, not immediately trying to swing the pendulum in the other direction and saying, whoa, 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 it's nonsense to talk about that issue. That's basically what Chief Saunders did. So if you're a Torontonian, I'm sorry your police chief isn't taking it that seriously. When we come back in just a couple of moments, I'm going to have two interviews. They're going to run consecutively, not concurrently, about not terrorism specifically, but more importantly, the importance of discussing these issues and being free to discuss these issues. 
and in one case with Lars Hedegaard in just a moment, what can happen that threatens your life if you do. That's all coming up in just a moment on Lawton Online. You're listening to TheRebel.media. Stay tuned, folks. Listening to Lawton Online with your host Andrew Lawton, exclusively on the Rebel Media. Email your thoughts to Andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet Andrew using at Andrew Lawton. We are back here on Lawton Online on the Rebel Media. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. Earlier on in the show, to kick off this week's podcast, I was talking about the terrorist attack that took place in Toronto. And this is really something that, despite the fact that the suspect is a Canadian-born man, it still speaks volumes about a problem that exists, which is the threat of Islamic terror. All violence is bad, all murder is bad, I get that, but it's specifically an issue for the West, including Canada. We are not immune to this when Muslim radicals, Muslim radicals, terrorists that believe their religion justifies the death of innocents, when they decide they want to advance their aims through violence. And this issue has come about through immigration issues as well. It's not exclusive just to homegrown radicalization. And last week on the show, I promised you a very special treat of an interview, and I'm glad that I get to make good on that promise today. Last week, I spoke to Lars Hedegaard, the founder of the Danish Free Press Society, a journalist in Denmark, and a man who has fearlessly spoken out not only about the issues of demography in Europe and the issues of radical Islam and immigration, but also more fiercely the ability and right for people to discuss these issues. Discuss these issues without fear of censorship by state, but more importantly, without fear of someone killing you because you dare to question the party line. And that actually happened to him. A man tried to end his life. A man tried to kill Lars because the Prophet Muhammad wanted it. I don't know the rules here. So Lars Hedegaard was in Toronto on Thursday, March 10th, I believe. And he was doing an event with Paul Weston. It was sponsored by the Jewish Defense League. And I have a very special treat. Not only did I get the chance to speak with Lars Hedegaard, but also uh, Paul Weston himself. So we'll carry both of those interviews in full form for you in this edition of the program. But we'll start with Lars Hedegaard. Now, this is a man not only assassination attempts, state-enforced censorship as well, but also a man who has, in spite of all of that, not wavered in his decision to speak the truth and speak freely. And we're seeing in Europe now vindication for him. A lot of what he has warned people about, even at his own expense, has come to pass, it seems. Lars Hedegaard, so wonderful to have the chance to talk to you in person. Thank you very much for your time today, sir. Thanks for having me. So one thing I I want to start on, because this is obviously one of the the defining moments of, of not just your career, but your life, has been an assassination attempt against you for criticizing radical Islam. Now, this has been criticism that's also had you going through the Danish court, prosecuted and uh, later appealed for hate crimes, and yet you're still speaking. So you have not let something that would deter so many people deter you. Explain how you've decided to do that, where that resolve has come from. Well, we don't have a choice. Uh, We must uh, not only maintain in the abstract the right of free speech, we must speak freely, otherwise you don't, a right you do not exercise will eventually wither. So I think it's important that you do not uh, become intimidated, uh, not scared. People can call you uh, any name in the book, um, but you know, increasingly I, I get the feeling that this is not really concerning uh, too many Danes or too many Europeans because they are gradually realizing uh, that there is a danger to all our freedoms, including uh, free speech. So I decided I won't change anything, uh, despite my uh, court cases. And, you know, I was acquitted uh, by uh, the Supreme Court of Denmark in a unanimous decision. uh, I was just uh, convicted uh, uh, on the 4th of March for having named the name of my would-be killer, 
because there's a gag order, uh, not to mention his name, even though he has been uh, a fugitive from Danish justice for three years and is probably you know, with the Islamic State. So I decided uh, that once I heard that he was out of jail, he'd been arrested in Turkey mm -hmm. uh, and was then let out mysteriously. Uh, in uh, September 2014, uh, and I decided, well, I'm going to break or violate this gag order. Uh, I cannot accept that my name and my picture is well known, and he has the opportunity to, to, to run away and hide. So many people would, in your situation, have, have given up. And we've seen this in Canada with human rights commissions, where people have uh, been gone after by the government, people like Mark Stein, Ezra Levant, writers that have been, uh, in a lot of ways, talking about similar issues to you. And it's this censorship by a thousand cuts, in a way. I mean, just going after people. People don't have the ability financially to fight these cases. People don't have the, the willpower to do it. And something that, like I said at the beginning, that we all take for granted and assume is a force, free speech, people assume it's a Western value in Europe, in Canada, in the United States, it's so not respected as a black and white issue that, yes, there is free speech. That's right. Um, <clears throat> and it's not only, of course, the, uh, uh, the government and uh, the public prosecutor. I mean, these are certainly not nice people, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, uh, it goes much deeper than that. It's, it's a, a sort of continuous intimidation that could end in, in a murder. You could be beaten up in the streets and uh, you can be shut out from, from uh, the public discourse. You can be shut out from uh, newspapers. Uh, they won't uh, carry your stuff. You don't appear on television or radio. But... Um, I think I managed to to uh, keep the faith and and uh, just continue, and I think I'm getting uh, more and more supported. Well, and I wanted to talk about that because one of the big issues that was really at the crux of your troubles in Denmark, as I understand it, was you talking mm. about uh, rates of uh, pedophilia, mm. sexual assault taking place in in areas that had heavy Muslim immigration. And now we're looking at, especially with the mm. refugee crisis, and I know this is something that uh, will be uh, influencing remarks uh, at an event this mm. evening, uh, we're, we're seeing that this is actually uh, taking hold. We mm. saw what happened in Cologne, Germany, New Year's Eve. We're seeing what's happening in Sweden, Denmark right now, right? This, this very, uh, well, this very <clears throat> much. So yeah, have you been vindicated? I believe I have, and I believe that uh, more and more people would come to, to see the truth. It's not... Uh, I mean, gang rape and, and uh, molestation, etc., is not so much a problem in Denmark right now. It could become worse. But if you look to Sweden, it is really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, Sweden is undoubtedly the rape capital of the world um, next to Lesotho in uh, so Southern <laughs> Africa. Yeah. Um, I saw some statistic recently that something like 20 25% of all Swedish women will eventually be victims of rape, the and, way it's going now. And this is a, a country, I just want to make very clear, is often held up by so many on the left in Canada as this socialist utopia, you know, big government, education, health care, all of these different things. But the demographics are leading to a very stark reality or contrast to that. And also the welfare state, the famous mm -hmm. yes. welfare state is now, is now crumbling. Uh, you see cuts upon cuts in, in, in uh, the general welfare level. Uh, in order for, for the Swedes to accommodate hundreds of thousands of uh, immigrants. Uh, you know, uh, until just a few months ago, Sweden had absolutely unlimited uh, immigration, led by the government, who came out and said, anyone, we will uh, welcome 22 million Syrians, if need be. We've got lots of room. What they didn't think was they had to, must have a place to live, housing, housing. <laughs> uh, they should have money so they can they can live, uh, and it's impossible, of course, for the for the tiny I mean ten nine million Swedes to pay for this. Even if they paid a hundred percent taxes, they could not uh, sustain this sort of of uh, immigration onslaught. Um, other European countries will come to the same uh, realization, and uh, in my country, uh, our government who promised which promised to limit immigration, 
basically cut it off from the third world just half a year ago. It's now turned completely around, and uh, we'll be accepting uh, 100,000, mainly Muslim so-called refugees, from Syria and adjacent countries. When you get 100,000 100, of these people, you're not getting 100,000. You're getting 300, 400,000, because once they're there, they'll bring in their wives and uh, children. Um, they will start producing children who will then have the right to, to, to bring in spouses from, mm -hmm. from uh, the third world or the Muslim world, etc. So um, the best prediction is that in 30 years, uh, Sweden will be a Muslim majority country and, of course, uh, join the organization of the Islamic Conference. When we look at uh, some of these numbers in Europe, this is by no means a new phenomenon. A lot of this has been happening, albeit a little bit more subtly, uh, in the past decade. It only seems like now that there's uh, some awareness from North American countries about this. Uh, do you think that Europe is, is really a harbinger of what we can expect in Canada and the United States in the near future? I have absolutely no doubt wow. uh, that this is going to happen. The thing is that... that uh, we can accommodate uh, people who come from abroad, even from China, Vietnam, uh, Tibet, uh, uh, any place, if they are willing to become part of the Danish population. They're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, we, are, uh, we are certainly not racist. We don't care if people are uh, brown-skinned or white-skinned or <clears throat> whatever. What counts is you come to our country, you want to make a life there. You want to mingle uh, with the local population. It doesn't not necessarily mean that you have to marry them, but you want to participate in, in, uh, in our culture. Uh, you have to value our language, learn it, value our history, value our culture. And then it doesn't matter whatever else you are, where you come from. But when you talk about the vast majority of Muslim immigrants, they will never get to the point where they will say, we are bona fide Danes. We want to, to partake of this uh, history uh, that goes back at least a thousand years. We, we want to be uh, like other Danes, except that we believe in a different God. But who cares if they wanted to become part of us? <coughs> Excuse me. The experience is that most of them never get to that point. They set up, set up parallel societies governed by Sharia councils, which is now the big scandal in Denmark. Most or many mosques now have uh, Sharia councils. So uh, if you are the uh, victim of a crime in the ghetto, in the Muslim ghettos, you don't go to the police, you go to the local Sharia council, and they will then adjudicate uh, the case. So, and, and the government is basically endorsing this with the power of law or, or allowing it to happen with the power of law. Uh, the government is doing absolutely nothing. I mean, they ought to be well aware of what's happening. And uh, you don't see any action. Of course they could, if they wanted to. They could close down these mosques where uh, preachers are um, preaching, as we, we now know, they, the stoning of women, uh, circumcision of, of uh, girls, the right of men to beat their wives. Um, and they are also uh, preaching uh, social fraud on a massive scale, even trying to encourage their flock to cheat. Hmm. And this is out in the open now. And the government is doing nothing. I wanted to ask, and this is more of a Canadian-centric question, but I'm sure you can uh, approach it from your background as well. We hear all the time in this country about the value of multiculturalism, the value of having all of these different cultures coming to this country, retaining their own culture. And this flies in the face of what you said a couple of moments ago, which is necessary in places like Denmark for people to come, integrate, adopt a Danish culture. Can multiculturalism exist alongside an existing, in our case, Canadian culture, but in any country? I would say no. Uh, I think you have to distinguish when you talk about cultures. You have to distinguish between uh, populations that have historical roots in your country. I mean, you have a French-speaking population mm -hmm. that has as much right 
to be Canadians as the as the Brits and the Anglo's. Uh, in Denmark, we have a an old German minority in the southern part of uh, Jutland, and uh, they've been there for hundreds of years, and of course have a right to. But I mean, when you talk about new people coming in, uh, wanting to set up a separate culture, that's a different matter altogether. They should be integrating, or trying to integrate to the best of their ability into mainstream society. And I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, people setting up uh, Thai restaurants or, or Chinese <laughs> restaurants, uh, we all love that. But these are people who create no trouble. They're not trying to impose a political system on us as uh, a great number of Muslims and especially their imams are trying to. They're trying to replace our constitution with the Quran, uh, And I don't think they should have the right to do that. Anyone can come to Denmark if they want to become part of it. And that's an old story in Denmark. We have had <clears throat> immigrants from Poland, and we had uh, Germans, we had uh, many Jews, we have had people from all over Asia and South America, and, and they're welcome to live the life they want uh, as private citizens. But th there's a different thing if they wanted to set up uh, a South American uh, sort of uh, cultural government. Uh, that would take over uh, parts of our society. So you have to make a distinction. Whenever you're talking about an issue that comes back to Islam, there is almost this ritualistic reminder that we always seem to get of, oh, well, the ones that cause the problems are a minority. The radicals are a minority. Well, that's Do you buy into that? Um, no, I don't. Do so you think uh, radicalism uh, comprises the majority of Muslims? Well, at least in Denmark. There was a uh, recent poll... Uh, that I heard about two days ago, it showed that 77 point some percent of uh, Muslims in Denmark want Sharia law to be the law of the land. You could not call that uh, moderate, could you? And it's even gone up by leaps and bounds from uh, less than 50 percent to now 77 percent. So that means that uh, integration of Muslims in general has failed in a big way. You're having, in this moment here, as well as in the course of your travels here, the opportunity to, to speak to Canadians about an issue that a lot of Canadians have, I th I'm going to say for the most part, only witnessed abroad or think they're witnessing abroad, reading about what you've endured as well. What is it that you think Canadians need to be aware of here? about this issue, whether we're looking at refugees, which is a, a large issue in Canada right now, or even more broadly, immigration challenges? Well, I think the main thing that you have to... Uh... I, I, I do, will not presume to, to, to give you advice, but if I were to, uh, I would say you have to observe the very clear distinction between the secular society, secular laws, and theocracy. I don't think these two very, very antagonistic concepts can coexist. One will win, the other will lose. And if we keep importing uh, adherents of theocracy, we are going to get theocracy, at least in parts of the country where the writ of the law will not run. When we look at really coming full circle to how we started this discussion, talking about freedom of speech, talking about our ability to discuss these uh, along with any number of other issues, do you feel in the last five years that overall it's gotten better or worse for preservation of freedom of speech in the West? Well, it's got, uh, it's got both worse and, to an extent, better. Worse uh, in the sense that uh, um, Muslim parallel societies, parallel enclaves, um, have had a chance to consolidate, uh, but also on the, on the bright side of things, uh, people are getting more and more aware of the danger. Our problem is to get our government to do anything about it. But then, of course, we will have to change the government. And this is ultimately where it comes to a, a really a broader question here. Does the government and the culture, the broader society, which one's more important here? Because in a lot of these issues, I, I think government is irrelevant to really where people's own mindsets are in, in conjunction with these issues. That may be true, uh, but uh, on the assumption that people 
uh, reserve a right to defend themselves and their communities. Uh, I mean, if you're being uh, molested, uh, raped, robbed uh, in the streets and, and uh, you feel you're being encroached upon by alien uh, forces, citizens should have the right to organize and defend mm-hmm. themselves to the extent that the state cannot or will not. And uh, I think that is coming along. Now, get me right. I'm absolutely opposed to uh, lawlessness and, and, and chaos. But I am a historian by training, and, and uh, I can see the pattern. If, if you leave the people unprotected, they will eventually try to protect themselves and their culture and their children's future. Fascinating topic here in discussion. Looking forward to uh, continuing to follow your work. Lars Hedegaard joining me live in studio. Lars, thank you very much, sir. Well, thanks. It's been a pleasure. That was just absolutely incredible. And I'm not talking about my performance, although I'm pretty good if I do say so myself. But that Lars speaks those words. That he speaks those words, that he expresses those thoughts. And... I honestly meant it when I said earlier that this is the show about warriors. Being a warrior takes many different forms. He's not on the battleground in Afghanistan, but he is on the ideological battleground. He is on the front lines of the culture war, and more importantly, the war of cultures. And I don't know who's winning this war right now. There are many stories that I encounter that make me think that we on the right are losing it. But the fact that people like him have not given up just yet means there's still hope of reclaiming this. We have to take a quick break here. As always, I welcome your thoughts on that interview with Lars. Andrew at andrewlawton.ca is my email address. When we come back, we will talk to one other free speech warrior about a very different side of the same coin, and that is Paul Weston, who will be my guest in just a couple of moments here on Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay tuned, Canada. Reverent, intelligent, and indefatigable. You're tuned in to Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. I'm back. I know, I only left you for a, for a couple of moments there. Great to have you still tuning into the program here. If you still are, if you're not, well, you won't hear this anyway, so that message wasn't directed at you. When I introduced this uh, show and the interview with Lars Hedegaard, I mentioned that he appeared alongside another guest, also very cr- credentialed and qualified to speak on this topic, and that is Paul Weston who is uh, the chairman of Liberty GB in the United Kingdom and also a former politician, a political candidate. And again, another man who, like Lars, has actually been prosecuted by the state. Now, in the case of Paul Weston, the charges were dropped, but still placed in handcuffs and brought to jail for speaking not even his words. That's the most amusing part of this. We'll talk about that later on. I'll give you a hint. It was a beloved former British Prime Minister's words that ended up putting Paul Weston in the slammer on this. But he's, again, someone on the front lines of this battle, which is not just a battle of liberties and free speech, not just a battle of demography and immigration, but a battle of whether we value political correctness and freedom, whether we value censorship, whether we value kowtowing to the demands of every group, whether we value multiculturalism, cultural relativism, or the belief that, yes, some cultures are superior than others. These are all the options we can pick on this fight. And I can guarantee you that you tuning in do not want to be on the wrong side of history. Well, we're seeing the collapse of so many elements of Western culture. And we've made our own bed. We have. 
But now it's time to flip it over and make a new one. Paul Weston also speaking last Thursday in Toronto. I so wish I had the chance to make it up there. I was hoping I did, but unfortunately, the uh, two-hour drive I wasn't able to make with uh, just other uh, commitments I had going on. Uh, But I was so happy I was able to earlier this week, actually, uh, catch up with Paul. Now, he was in uh, the United States at the time, so it wasn't an in-person interview. But still, I bring you now my interview with British freedom fighter Paul Weston. It's great to have you on the show, Paul. Thanks very much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me on, Andrew. Thank you. So you spoke uh, in Toronto on Thursday, obviously, and I was glad we we were able to have some time uh, today to chat about it because I I wanted to actually read to you a passage from a Toronto Star piece about that event. Uh, It says, Right-wing European demagogues have been invited to Canada to share their fear-mongering, unquote. This is the sort of treatment you get back home as well, isn't it? Well, it's, uh, you know, we all get it, Andrew. If you, uh, if you speak out against mass migration, if you speak out specifically about the Islamic um, immigration and the, uh, the Islamic behavior in Europe, you are denounced as a racist, xenophobic, uh, Islamophobic uh, character. And it's all bizarre just to purely shut down on, on any free speech within Europe these days. A lot of the criticisms that have been leveled against you and, and other members of the movement you have led here have been uh, basically, as you mentioned, racism, Islamophobia as well. And I, I know that there doesn't seem to be a lot more uh, depth to that. People don't really want to go into the numbers you talk about. People don't really want to go into some of the themes that uh, you and uh, your, your colleague Lars have brought up as well. And as we saw in, in your case a couple of years ago, I mean, there's even the, the threat of arrest for, for talking about these issues. So I, I wanted to start on that freedom component here, that freedom of speech component, because would you agree with my characterization that we cannot come anywhere near to solving these issues if we can't even discuss them? This is absolutely it in a nutshell. I mean, at the moment, we have a huge and growing problem with Islam. But Islam is just a symptom of the disease, and the disease is political correctness. And political correctness is what is stopping us from being able to tell the truth about Islam. And until we can do that, there's very little we can do about the Islamic threat. Is there a distinction in your eyes between, uh, you know, Islam and radical Islam, or is that simply a a cosmetic distinction that doesn't really have much of a bearing on the actual uh, discussions? I think the difference really with, with radical Islam is radical Islam is, is essentially Islam. They are just uh, following the letter of Sharia law uh, more closely. But fundamentalist Islam, I think, is only when people talk about acts of violence. There are plenty of Muslims who wish to live under Sharia law in the West who don't want to blow people up in order to get it. Uh, 40% in, uh, in Britain, Muslims, wish to live under Sharia law. They are not moderate people, but they're never described as fundamentalists because they don't go around blowing people up, but they are fundamentalist in ideology. When we look at that number, and I, I know there have been similar studies that have been done, not uh, as much in Canada, but in the United States that have shown uh, very, very high numbers of people that, like those, believe, yes, in, in Sharia law, though aren't necessarily trying to achieve that uh, through violence. How should a, a government respond to that? Because, that, I mean, ultimately you can make a case that if they're not prepared to have a violent overthrow of government, that they're just expressing their own uh, freedoms as well, are they not? Well, they are, but their freedoms, uh, their freedoms impound upon our freedoms. You know, we don't wish to, <laughs> clearly, we don't want to live under Sharia law in Britain. And if we are unable to mount any sort of coherent, uh, peaceful, articulate defense against this, uh, then we are eventually, you know, not, to, not tomorrow or next week, but within a decade or two decades, we will be living under Sharia law in Britain. One hallmark of uh, Sharia is basically that you cannot criticize Islam. You cannot criticize uh, Muhammad. You cannot criticize Allah. And I I wanted to actually bring around to uh, one of the pivotal moments in in your own uh, history here uh, for people that might not be as familiar with it. Uh, Not only were you arrested for... Essentially, I mean, the, the, the British version of, of accusing you of hate speech, but you weren't even speaking your own words when you were arrested. Well, that's it. And uh, I didn't tell the police whose words they were at the time. It, it was an interesting experiment in what can and can't be said. But of course, they were, they were the words of Winston Churchill taken from his book, The River Wars, 
which in the early uh, 20th century he was up in the, the Sudan uh, fighting against them. Uh, so they were absolutely, his words, taken verbatim. The woman reported me for inciting religious hatred. Uh, the police turned up, arrested me, took me to the police station, took my fingerprints, took my DNA, uh, and went on to attempt to mount a proper criminal prosecution, which would, uh, which would have meant two years in jail. But when it all came out that it was, uh, it was Winston Churchill's words taken from a book that you can buy quite freely on any high street in the country, uh, they, they became <laughs> slightly embarrassed and all the charges were dropped. But the intention is always there in Britain is to instill a certain amount of fear uh, into, into anybody that wants to talk about these issues. And it works very well. Most people are too frightened to talk about these things. Well, and this goes well beyond political correctness, which is almost a, a societally driven form of groupthink or form of, of censorship. I mean, this is actually something tantamount to state mandated censorship. And I guess there is a big question that must be asked here, which is that when you talk about uh, a lot of these themes, a lot of these issues, I would assume that most Britons would want to uh, believe that freedom of speech is a hallmark of a free country. So why is there not more pushback to this? I don't really think the Brits do think that anymore. I think we've been hit on... Is it really that bad that not even in the abstract is freedom of speech valued? I don't think so, not anymore. You know, we've been, we've, we have been suffering so much uh, indoctrination from an early age at school that it has become... You know, they don't really think of it as free speech anymore. If you, are being, if you are being nasty about ethnic minorities or nasty about Islam, as in speaking the truth... Uh, People have got to the to the level of indoctrination now that they that they literally view it as genuine hate speech. They've been told it's hate speech so many times, and this starts, you know, at the age of three in schools, where three-year-olds are now being prosecuted for for inciting racial hatred. And you know, you get to them at that age. By the time they're they're adults, they uh, they have been well and truly conditioned, like the you know, like the uh, the Jesuit version of you know, "Give me the boy for seven years, and I will give you the man." One problem with uh, political well, uh, of the many problems with political correctness, one that is is abundantly apparent, at least in North America, is that it doesn't seem to be by by my view anyway. You may have a differing in, uh, opinion on this. It doesn't seem to be driven by. Uh, people other than, you know, white sort of secular progressives. I mean, they seem to be the ones out of a fear of offending others, out of a fear of being seen as racist. Uh, is that true of Britain as well? Or are you seeing a push from, uh, like those uh, Muslims you cited who want Sharia law, are they the ones that are really pushing for this uh, status as being a group beyond criticism? Well, they are already under, uh, under a protected class of person clause uh, by the British government. So I, of course, am not. I'm a, you know, I'm a white, Christian, heterosexual, married male. Yes, you're the bottom uh, of the privileged barrel, I believe. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we, have a, we have no pr- uh, uh, protected uh, class at all. So, you know, we are, you know, and the reason for that is very simple. You know, we were the ones that, uh, that, that built the foundations that Western civilization sits on. So we are the ones that need to have our whole ideological roots and, uh, and sort of foundations destroyed. And this is exactly what I think political correctness is all about. One uh, big uh, question that has been raised by so many people is how do you have this discussion? How do you have these themes raised without going into that territory where someone is going to accuse you of racism? Because most people aren't able to, uh, like yourself and and like a lot of people who are uh, fiercely critical of these issues, like Lars Hedegaard, etc., most people are are afraid of that. They don't go into that and say, you know, come at me, you know, give me all you've got. So how can we have these discussions without it devolving to that place? You just have to have a few people that are prepared to put their, their heads above the parapet and you know, we can utilize social media to get the message out you know, because the mainstream media won't touch me and the sort of things that I say. You know, I do interviews with them, which are then promptly pulled, canceled or edited to the point of nothing. So, so we simply have you know, the, the few who are prepared to do it will stand up there, say what we think. And hopefully we will garner sufficient public support from people who agree with us and who are grateful that at least someone somewhere is talking about it. So that is how I view our job over the next few years. 
One uh, criticism that was leveled against Donald Trump a few months ago, uh, one of the front runners, obviously, for the U.S. presidency, was against uh, his proposal to temporarily halt Muslim immigration to the United States. Now, people have made, not from within the government, but outside the government, a similar call in, in Canada in light of, of issues more d- directly with terrorism than, than other demographic issues here. Is this something that you think has merit as a proposal? Yeah. Well, it's on one of our central planks for our party manifesto is that we halt all all Islamic immigration for a period of five years for exactly the same reason that Trump is saying. And, you know, Europol, uh, for your listeners who don't know, Europol is the European uh, police force, uh, totally, uh, totally above law, really. And they have said that the amongst the migrants coming in, you know, the millions of migrants coming into Europe now, Uh, ISIS have said they will smuggle in thousands of jihadists. And now Europol has said, yes, they have. They know of at least 7,000 jihadists who've come in within this migrant wave. Two of them were involved in the shoot-up in Paris recently. So any, any Western politician who brings further migrants into the country, knowing that they will have a percentage of people that want to kill us and blow us up, When it happens, and it will happen, all of those politicians like Angela Merkel and David Cameron, they will have the blood of the slain on their hands. But are there not also a lot of Muslims that are equally trying to flee these regimes? I mean, there does seem to be a a very heavy amount of criticism uh, towards Daesh, towards the Islamic State from Muslims that are as equally as concerned about their own heads getting cut off there. Yeah, there are. And I think there are now 1.5 million living living in the Lebanon. And I think that if you are coming from those areas, there are safe havens around Syria. Now, I'm not saying that, it's, you know, that, that, that we should simply say no to these people. Cameron, Prime Minister Cameron, has said he will accept 20,000 from the refugee camps. So you know, that is a fair way of doing it. But the idea that – and also, you know, something like 80 percent of the so-called Syrian refugees are not from Syria. They're from Eritrea and Somalia. So the whole thing has been turned over to some – big money-making, people-smuggling sort of escapade where the genuine sufferers are not being taken in, but the economic migrants are. And and you can see this when you look at the boats. They are 80% young males. There are no old women, no old men, no small children. I mean, there are some, but the overwhelming majority are young males of military fighting age. And I think that's something we should should give serious uh, uh, pause for thought about. Do you think from a, an issue of, uh, from a perspective, rather, of freedom of religion, that there is a, an importance to preserve the ability to freely worship for Muslims in the West? Because this is where a lot of people would say that what you're pushing for puts Muslims at a, a different level of rights than non-Muslims. I think that uh, the, the, the one way of looking at this, which is not too draconian, is to say, of course, Muslims are free to uh, adhere to their faith. But I don't think that any Western state should be, at a state level, should be promoting Islam. I don't think that we should be allowed to build mosques that are funded by Saudi Arabian hardline money or Diabandi, uh, Pakistani hardline money. I think if they are free to worship in their homes themselves, that's fine. But we should not have any state-funded apparatus encouraging this because it sounds horrible, but, uh, but, but as their numbers grow... Uh, Britain and the West will become steadily more Islamic. And we can't do this in their countries. You know, I can't go to Pakistan uh, and practice Christianity. I would, you know, to, to actually live, I would have to convert to Islam first before I went there. And I think that is a perfectly uh, reasonable demand made by the Pakistani authorities. And I think it is also a perfectly reasonable demand for Western governments to apply exactly the same laws. So in terms of Muslims worshipping in, in Britain and the West fine in their homes, but not at a state-funded level. I disagree with that entirely. But if we're basically preserving and protecting our freedoms at the expense of another group, how are we in, in that context any better than these countries that you're describing that I think we are superior to? Well, I mean, even if you, take a, even if you leave aside the fact that we are superior or, or inferior, the point is we are different. 
you know, we have a we have a two thousand year old Judeo Christian uh, civilization that we've built, built, built also on Roman law and, and and Greek democracy. You know, law and democracy has nothing to do with Islam. Judeo Christianity has nothing to do with Islam. We have to accept that if we are going to accept these people in such numbers, that we will destroy our own cultural heritage. And when it comes to freedom of speech. Uh, I don't believe that, uh, that, that total freedom of speech can be utilized in order to destroy something as wonderful and, uh, and as glorious as Western civilization. It is a very foolhardy uh, thing to do in the, in the short term, but in the midterm and the long term, if you look to the end of this century, or look to the fact that a, a, a child born today will only be 34 by the year 2050. Now, by 2050 much of the West, unless things change, will be essentially Islamic countries, simply by weight of demographic numbers coupled with migration. So I don't think that we should just sign all this uh, glorious history of ours away based on the fact that we must allow them to do exactly as they please in our countries. I wanted to ask you, Paul, a little bit about one more uh, con- temporary political theme that's uh, going on in the UK right now, which is whether or not to leave the EU. Do you think that something like this, uh, what we're discussing here about the demographic issues, do you think that has any bearing on that discussion as well? Uh, not really, no. Uh, you know, we've got something like 350,000 EU nationals a year coming to, uh, to Britain. Um, if we leave the EU, we might, uh, we, well, we will be able to have more say over who comes in. But something that is completely outside of the EU is the 350, 450,000, if you count illegals, uh, coming in from Muslim parts of the world, which our government really should have a say over. Uh, nothing to do with the EU at all, uh, but apparently our government is still uh, very keen on having them in for some reason, which is something I, I don't understand, given the level of, of threat uh, that comes with that. You know, we have had for the last year one major terrorist attempt a month foiled by our intelligence services. So the idea that we should be bringing any, let alone in the hundreds of thousands, we shouldn't be bringing any more of them in. You know, we're a tiny little island. We're overpopulated. We're under-resourced. And it's just insanity for us to be doing what we're doing now, and something I cannot get my head around at all. How is the UK looking in this respect compared to countries like Germany, countries like uh, Sweden, for example? Are they all going through something at a similar pace, or are we seeing uh, some disparities there? Well, we're seeing disparity this year with uh, with Germany. <laughs> yes, um, well, with its one million uh, so-called refugees in the past year. Exactly, and they're talking about half a million more this year. And one thing that they don't talk about is family reunification, and they're anticipating three to four people will be joining each one of those million from last year. So you, you know, you put, uh, you know, you do the figures on that over an 18-month period, and you're looking at five, six million uh, Muslims coming into Germany, and they are aged roughly 18 to 30. The demographic of 18 to 30-year-old Germans is only 15 million people. So if you bring 5 million people in from the Islamic world, you have just diluted your future base of, uh, of Germans to, uh, to uh, only uh, 30, 33% Muslims come in. So you've diluted your base massively. And German women age 30, sorry, age 40, uh, most of them only have one child. So this is something with the Muslims coming in with their three, four children. You're looking at a total uh, reversal of who is the majority in Germany over a 20, 30 year period, which, again, I don't understand why the West would be doing this. I mean, it is literally paying, paying good money out to colonize their own countries. And Germany is the worst example at the moment with this. Sweden's not very far behind, and uh, we're not very far behind Sweden. Well, hopefully your words will come as a cautionary warning to those who need to hear it most. Paul Weston joining me on the line, chairman of Liberty GB. Great to have you on the show, sir. I hope you enjoyed your time in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Thank you. It's amazing that when people speak the truth or what they believe to be true. I mean, it doesn't even matter for the purposes of free speech whether it is accurate or not. In these cases, there's a lot of merit to it. 
But amazing when people speak the truth, how handcuffs, prosecution, court orders, jail. These are the responses in so-called free countries, in Denmark, in Britain. And we've seen in Canada with the human rights commissions that that's not exactly a far cry from what has happened here. These are countries that we are told are the models of Western civilization that are sacrificing their freedom, our freedom. For what? For making other people happy? For making other people comfortable? How long until we are completely irrelevant, completely insignificant, because we have bent over so backwards? This is not about fear-mongering. This is about recognizing what happens when you cede control of your own culture. And this is not that, oh, we don't want brown people. No, that is nowhere near the argument that is being made by these men nor by me. It's that we don't want people who want to be a part of our country for all of the benefits we offer, the goodies, as a government, but don't want to be a part of the culture that has built that. There's a reason that in Israel, they don't want to give all Palestinian citizenship because they know that it's Israeli culture and Jewish culture that has built Israel to what it is today. If you compromise that, you compromise the very core of its existence, the very fiber of its being. Yet in Canada, in Britain, even to some extent in the United States, depending on where you are, that fear has been lost. It's not realized by people. They think that culture is something that is irrelevant or relative. Glad there is still a voice in Canada. We have to wrap things up for the show today, folks. My big thanks to my guests, Paul Weston and Lars Hedegaard, as well as all who wrote in, tuned in, and listened in here. We will be back next Thursday with another exciting, I hope, edition of Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. Thanks so much. I'm Andrew Lawton. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the Rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary. Thanks for watching. Click here to never miss a Rebel update. Want even more of the Rebel? Well, click here to become a premium member.